Well, welcome everybody, and welcome to this presentation of the story of the 1980 eruption at Mount St. Helens and the continuing story of what has happened at the volcano since 1980 all the way through to the present. My name is Seth Moran, and I'm the scientist in charge at the Cascades Volcano Observatory, as well as a seismologist by profession. And to start off with, I thought I would tell you a little bit about the volcano observatory that I work at, Cascades Volcano Observatory, or CVO, and how we do our job before getting into the story of the 1980 eruption. So this first slide shows a picture of the staff at CVO that was taken in spring of 2019. We have roughly 70 people that work in the building. About half of them are really specific to the Cascade range of volcanoes in Washington and Oregon, but we also have folks who specialize in working in volcanoes internationally and people who do special laboratory work um, as well. At CVO, the group of people there have a range of specialties, and this diagram shows all those specialties feeding into a, a central circle, which is CVO. And we have hydrologists, geologists, seismologists, geochemists, geodesists. Also, we have IT specialists, computer programmers, modelers, and we also have people who specialize in outreach, and we have people who specialize in administration because we are a government agency and there are rules that we have to make sure that we are following. So all of these people, all these specialties are important to have in one place because volcanoes are very, very complex systems and it requires a lot of different specialists and specialties to fully understand what is happening at a volcano. And those folks need to be in the same place so they can interact synergistically and um, and help each other understand what their respective data sets are showing. So this photo, next slide in this photo, shows the start of the May 18, 1980 eruption, a very famous photograph by, taken by Gary Rosenquist. This uh, was the start, the unofficial start, of the Cascades Volcano Observatory. We were born out of this eruption. Before then, there was no observatory in the Pacific Northwest. CBO was officially made an observatory on May 18th, of 1982. And this next slide shows a, uh, a picture of the, of the Earth with um, largely with, with North America and shows the locations of the five observatories that make up collectively the U.S. Geological Survey's Volcano Hazards Monitoring System. And uh, in addition to CVO, which is located in Vancouver, Washington, we have the Alaska Volcano Observatory located, located up in Anchorage, we have the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, which is the oldest observatory in the U.S. It was born in 1912. That's based on uh, the Big Island near, uh, near Hilo. And then we have the California Volcano Observatory down in Menlo Park. And lastly, the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. For CVO, this map shows our turf. We have responsibility for the volcanoes in uh, Washington and Oregon and Idaho. This shows just the Washington and Oregon part, the Cascades part. And there are triangles on this map that show the locations of the 25 places where magma has come out of the ground in Washington and Oregon over the last 12,000 years. The triangles are colored differently based upon what we uh, call the threat level. Um, the being very high, very high threat is red, down to very low is green. The threat level has something to do, is, is a combination of the volcanic hazard, how frequently does it erupt, how explosively does it erupt, and the exposure of society to those volcano hazards. How close are people? How close do aviation corridors go through it? And what you can see in this map is that there are uh, eight red triangles in Washington and Oregon, the very high threat ones. Those include Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, and Mount St. Helens. And then in Oregon, it's Mount Hood, Three Sisters, Newberry, and Crater Lake. And then Mount Adams is in the, the high threat category. So to work with these volcanoes, we divide our work into three core functions. And this first slide here shows the first sphere, the first core function, which is research. This picture shows a tephra section. It's a picture of a lot of ash that was, or tephra, that fell uh, out of Glacier Peak Volcano in Washington uh, after an eruption 13,500 years ago. And in the lowermost part of the, of the, of the picture, there are two geologists, and I've got one of them circled with a black ellipse, 
And uh, you can see the geologists are about six feet in scale. This is a very thick section of tephra, and this is taken miles away from the volcano itself. So this is, this is the kind of thing that geologists uh, are doing that we need geologists to do, is to go out and map the deposits that have been produced by the different volcanic eruptions and to come up with an eruption history that we can use to make some forecasts about what is likely to happen at specific volcanoes in the future, as well as answer the question, the time old question, of which volcano is most likely to erupt. So this next slide shows a graphic that is a basically a summary of all the geologic research that's been done up and down the Cascades. And what we understand is that over the last 4,000 years, some volcanoes have erupted more than, uh, than others. So this graphic shows on the left-hand side a map going from Washington, Oregon to California of the Cascade volcanoes. There are triangles showing the locations of each of the volcanoes. And then on the right-hand side of the graphic, there's a box with a line, and the line, a horizontal line, is a timeline of the last 4,000 years, going from the 4,000 years ago on the left-hand side to the present on the right-hand side. And there are eruption icons, volcano eruption icons, corresponding to each moment in time when geologists know an eruption occurred at a volcano. So this allows you to look very quickly with your eye and determine which volcanoes are the ones that have uh, recently erupted and not. And what you can very quickly see is that Mount St. Helens has the most icons, has the, had the most eruptions over the last 4,000 years by far of any Cascade volcano. Mount Rainier is number two, Glacier Peak is number three, and then you have to go down to California to get number five, number four, and number five at Mount Shasta and Medicine Lake. And these eruption histories are being refined as geologists continue to work out in the field and uncover new evidence of eruptions. And uh, as time goes on, we have a better appreciation for uh, the relative rate of eruptions to expect in the Cascades. But what we can say right now, this next slide uh, goes back to the map I showed the first time of the locations of, of volcanoes and their, uh, the, 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 the colors that correspond to the, the different threat levels. What we know uh, is that there are, like I said before, 25 volcanoes that have erupted in the last 12,000 years in the Cascades of Washington, Oregon. There are, on average, two eruptions per century which is, and th those eruptions are usually multi-year, so one of the things we like to say is that on average, 10% of the time, a Cascade volcano is erupting. Don't necessarily know which one, but 10% of the time. And another way of, of framing that is that uh, the big one, the magnitude 9 earthquake that's going to occur in our future at some point um, off of our coast, those happen about every 450 to 500 years. Obviously, huge consequence event. And uh, in between those times, there are going to be on the order of nine or 10 cascade volcanoes that erupt. Those are gonna be much smaller consequence than the magnitude nine. But our experience with Mount St. Helens eruptions in 1980 and 2004 is that they're still very high consequence. And so it is important for us to be working with our volcanoes and doing the best we can to understand what the eruption history is and to monitor them, to monitor them as best we can. And to answer the question, based on the eruption history, the most likely volcano to erupt is Mount St. Helens, which erupts on average about once a century. Okay, so that's research. Our second core function is monitoring. And the basic idea behind monitoring, and this picture here shows on the right-hand side is a cross-section of a volcano uh, that uh, has the surface expression of the volcanic edifice itself. And then down below, there's a blob of magma and uh, there's dots around the magma. If that magma is moving, it will start breaking rock and creating earthquakes. That's what the little dots are. There are also some green arrows up on the surface. Those correspond to surface deformation that as magma moves, it has to make room for itself and uh, it pushes the surface of the earth away or towards the volcano. And then lastly, there are yellow arrows that are rising upwards from this body of magma coming out of the surface. That represents gases that come off of the, of the magma as it rises upwards and pressure is reduced and, uh, and gases start to sort of bubble out. So for monitoring, these are the three sort of pillars of monitoring is we look at earthquake activities with seismicity, we look at surface deformation, and we look at volcanic gases. There are, of course, other kinds of things to pay attention to with uh, thermal features and chemistry of hot springs and things like that, but these are the three primary uh, forms of volcano monitoring. 
Uh, this next graphic is a cartoon picture that shows a variety of different types of volcano monitoring strategies and equipment. Uh, there's a picture of a volcano erupting and on its side there is a uh, person that's working with a gas monitoring station on the surface, uh, on, the, on, the, on the ground. Um, then on the lower left-hand corner, there are a couple of different ways uh, of showing how deformation is monitored with tilt meters that are buried in the ground or with GPS instruments that are mounted on tripods uh, that give you a location. Then on the right-hand side, lower right-hand corner, there's uh, pictures of seismometers. And seismometers are, are quite small these days. They're about the size of a 12-ounce soda can and are buried in the ground, very sensitive, picking up earthquakes uh, of, of very small magnitudes, less than zero oftentimes. And then the upper right-hand corner represents remote sensing. This is one of the ways that we do thermal imaging uh, with satellites as well as with helicopters. We use webcams and of course also we use airplanes to do gas monitoring in the air. This picture here is a uh, picture taken of a monitoring station at Newberry Volcano. It shows uh, in the foreground a pipe that's about six feet tall. It has a hemispherical disc on top of it. That is the antenna for the GPS receiver. It is cemented into the ground, so it never changes its location. And then about mm, 15 feet away is an enclosure. It's about five feet by five foot by five foot. A person can get inside it. Uh, the enclosure is painted brown. It has solar panels on the outside for charging batteries on the inside. Um, on the inside of the enclosure is also electronics and there's a radio. And then on the outside there is a radio antenna that is beaming data from this station out to a receive site. And then lastly, there's a seismometer that you can't see in this picture that's buried. And so this is a fairly typical site that CVO installs that has a GPS and a seismometer on it. And that gives us two of those three pillars of volcano monitoring in one place. So this graphic here shows uh, the, a map of the Pacific Northwest of the volcanoes that are on, uh, on our list and uh, shows uh, the status of monitoring networks in the Cascades. And you can see that Mount St. Helens has 21 seismometers, 20 GPS stations, two tilt, one gas. It's in very good shape. It's a very good network, um, the best network in the Cascades and one of the best networks really, frankly, in the world. Um, Mount Rainier has 13 seismometers, six GPS. Mount Hood, eight seismometers, three GPS. Newberry, 12 seismometers, eight GPS. Those are in pretty good shape. They could use a little bit more, but they're in pretty good shape. And then we go to Glacier Peak, which has one seismometer, and Mount Baker, which has two seismometers. So there's some variability in the density of seismic networks up and down the Cascades, and that just reflects that um, we are moving <clears throat> uh, to, to improve networks uh, as we're able to, and dealing with high priority volcanoes, the highest priority volcanoes first, with Mount St. Helens because it's erupted several times, Mount Rainier and Mount Hood because they're fairly close to people, um, but we are actively working on uh, permits to install network uh, monitoring stations at Glacier Peak and Mount Baker. Okay, so that's the two of the core functions. Our third is community preparedness. And the reason why we spend time on that stems from uh, this picture, which is a picture of uh, a devastated landscape at the foot, in the foothills of uh, the volcano Naval de Ruiz in Colombia. And back in 1985, Naval de Ruiz woke up, was restless for a number of months. Scientists were down there monitoring the volcano. It was ice clad, it's an ice clad volcano and uh, there was an appreciation of the hazards that could create uh, if hot stuff gets on top of that ice, it can melt and create devastating floods. And um, in, in fact, um, the volcano did have an eruption and scientists were aware that it had erupted and a large lahar, a large volcanic mud flow was produced and started moving down river valleys. And uh, for a variety of reasons, word never got to the villages that were right at the mouths of these rivers. And two hours later, uh, Lahars came through and destroyed this village of Armero, Colombia, and killed over 20,000 people. And this took place, uh, this Lahar reached this city two hours after the event occurred. So these were preventable deaths. And one of the reasons uh, why 
nothing happened was that um, that, that word didn't get there is that people didn't know who the scientists were. They didn't necessarily trust the messaging. And so this really underlined the importance of scientists being involved, actively involved in the communities that are living around the volcanic systems to ensure that people understand what's going on with the volcanic systems. So in the Cascades, one of the ways that we deal with this is we, uh, we work with communities of partners around each volcanic system and uh, among other things form working groups and have developed, those working groups have developed uh, coordination plans, uh, hazard plans that define the players around each volcano and who all is going to, how people are going to respond and, and interact once a volcano wakes up. And these are really super critical to make sure that we get off on the right foot and minimize the amount of confusion and chaos that inevitably occurs when you have a crisis rapidly unfolding. We do this with lots and lots of partners, uh, with federal agencies like the National Park Service, with uh, universities like the University of Washington, University of Oregon, with fe uh, other federal and state agencies, and uh, counties and tribal agencies, and, uh, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of, of agencies that are involved in this community preparedness side of things. And that's what CVO does in a nutshell. And that's who these folks are that you see in this picture, uh, again, right here. Okay, now on to what you wanted to, you came to listen to. Uh, the story of the 1980 eruption. This is, again, a picture looking south into the crater of Mount St. Helens. So um, this graphic, next graphic shows uh, a map of southwest Washington, and there are yellow triangles on there that correspond to uh, the location of seismic stations that had been installed by the University of Washington in the 1970s. And this is as of 1979 is where these all these stations were located. And uh, right down here in the lower left-hand corner is Mount St. Helens, and there is one yellow triangle right down here. That is a station that was installed in 1972. It's located two miles to the west of Mount St. Helens, and this was the station that was primary when the volcano wake up. And you can see that the next nearest station is tens of miles away to the north. So um, I mentioned this station had been installed uh, in 1972, so there's actually eight years worth of seismic record at Mount St. Helens from this one station. And we knew that, um, the, that there were earthquakes occurring at Mount St. Helens. This is a photomicrograph of one uh, uh, of an earthquake that occurred. It's a uh, you know, very nice solid earthquake. There's a nice P wave at the start and then uh, wiggles die off over time. Uh, this happened in 1974. And uh, one of the things you can do with this is you can go through and count the number of earthquakes. You can't locate them because there's only one station, um, but you can count them. And so this plot here shows monthly counts going from 1972 through to March of 1980. And the vertical axis is from zero to 60. And uh, the, the, the strongest, the, 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 the uh, month with the most earthquakes uh, in this time frame was in um, J January of 1975 when there are sort of mid-50s, uh, but there were also months when there were just one or two or none, no earthquakes. So some variability, and that's also true today with what we see at Mount St. Helens during its background activity, is sometimes there's more earthquakes and sometimes there's fewer earthquakes. But there's definitely no trend line towards an increase in seismicity as you get up towards the 1980 time frame. From this perspective, um, Mount St. Helens really just woke up kind of out of the blue. And it woke up out of the blue with a bang. So this is a, uh, a, a picture showing a, uh, a helicorder plot of the, um, the, this first big earthquake. It was on March 20th at... 3.47 in the afternoon Pacific time, it was a magnitude 4.2. Um, these helicorder records, you'll see them a fair amount and you read them like a book, left to right, top to bottom. These marks here in the middle represent minute marks. So you can look at this P wave here, the start of the big 4.2, and the shaking lasts for oh, on the better part of a minute and a half. So you know, 4.2, it's a decent size event. So this earthquake happened, and like I said, there was just one seismic station out there. This produced some uncertainty in the interpretation. It could have been located under the volcano, or the location could have been off to the side. There was enough error in the location because of just having this one station out there that there was uncertainty in the interpretation. And it took a couple days 
for um, scientists to see that instead of a tectonic sequence, which would be a main shock and then aftershocks tailing off afterwards, that this was actually the reverse of that, that the 4.2 happened. And then in the days following, the numbers of earthquakes increased. And that's what's shown in this plot here that shows numbers of earthquakes counted per hour. And you can see from March 21st, uh, where it was counting at in the single digits, um, all of a sudden, in the middle of March 22nd, it went up to 10 and then 20 events per hour. So a very significant increase, and very clearly at that point, we are dealing with a volcano crisis. This next slide shows two 12-hour long uh, helicorder plots for St. Helens West. And uh, St. Helens West is the name of the station that was located two miles to the west of the volcano. This is from the first one on the left is from March 22nd, 23rd. And you can see this increase in numbers of earthquakes per unit time. And then going over here to the right hand side in the upper half of the plot, this is another web recorder. Um, you can see that uh, the earthquakes increased in rate again and got so big and so close together that you can no longer tell them apart by the time you get to the middle of this record. They're all bleeding together. And so what had to happen was uh, analysts had to change this particular healer quarter uh, recorder to a different station that was further away, station CPW, which is located 70 miles to the northwest of Mount St. Helens. And now you can see distinct events again and, and go back to counting. And that happened uh, on March 24th and March 25th. So a very rapid intensification of seismicity in just the first couple of days. This culminated on March 27th, just seven days afterwards, in the first confirmed explosion that happened at the surface. This picture is shows um, a photo that was taken shortly after that explosion of the summit of Mount St. Helens. It has a circular hole in the ice cap and a patch of dirty snow that gives confirmation that some uh, rock was thrown out during this, uh, during this explosion. Um, so very rapid from the first earthquake to the first explosion, just seven days. Four days later, on April, April 1st, the very first volcano hazards map was produced. This uh, graphic here shows that volcano hazards map. This was produced by USGS scientists who were working with Forest Service uh, folks at the time. The Forest Service uh, was, uh, the Gifford Pincho Forest Service was uh, the agency in charge of managing the crisis for this because they owned the land. And uh, this shows hazard zones for different sizes of events, um, places where basically uh, people could be impacted and, and, and structures could be impacted by uh, lahars, volcanic mud flows, as well as pyroclastic flows. And it also shows uh, different boundaries where uh, people could be impacted by events of different sizes. There's a small event boundary, this red dashed line that goes around the volcano, and then there's a medium event boundary that's a little bit further away. Um, and so this was the start of the process of establishing where it was uh, safe and not so safe for people to be. Um, from the USGS perspective, uh, from March 28th to May 18th, uh, after that uh, first explosion, it was a beginning of a rapid uh, deployment of monitoring stations and also watching the volcano and waiting for what was going to happen and trying to understand and make forecasts about what was likely to happen. And this picture here shows the um, uh, scientist working at the Coldwater Observation Post, which was just north of Mount St. Helens and is now called the Johnston Ridge Observatory, or Johnston Ridge. So on the um, seismic monitoring side of things, there was a very rapid effort to uh, increase the number of seismic stations that were beaming data to the University of Washington. This is a picture of, uh, of two seismologists installing a station uh, on top of Mount St. Helens on, uh, on, on May, uh, May 12th uh, at a place called Dog's Head, just one kilometer away from the volcano or about uh, uh, a little more than a half a mile. And uh, this next graphic here shows a map of the station location. So Mount St. Helens is in the middle here and um, these red triangles and the yellow triangles correspond to the locations of stations that have been installed by early April. This was a about a dozen stations that were working uh, by early April, which is really a miracle that that was pulled off, given how difficult the instrumentation was to work with back in the day, and also that it was still kind of winter and very difficult to work out there. So um, that was what was going on on the seismic side of th things. Uh, looking at the surface deformation side of things, this sort of second pillar, uh, there uh, 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 scientists worked hard to establish uh, a network of targets on the volcano that could be uh, could could have distances measured using uh, lasers, 
And so this left-hand picture here shows a target being established at a point on Mount St. Helens. You can see a helicopter in the distance and two scientists working in the foreground. And the target uh, is, is orange, it's rectangular, uh, it's maybe um, a foot by three feet in, in dimensions, and it has a series of highway reflectors, circular highway reflectors, uh, on the middle, and that gives a target for the laser to shoot off of. And then the right-hand side here um, shows a picture of Mount St. Helens in the dist distance with X's on the volcano showing the locations of these targets, and then in the foreground are scientists who are working with this laser rangefinder to, um, to shoot distances to all these different points. And this is how scientists tracked the deformation that was going on at Mount St. Helens uh, leading up to 1980. This graphic shows uh, a, a map of those lines, those distance lines, uh, and, um, and shows all the different ways that people were looking at them from the north to south and along the edifice itself. Um, on the right-hand side uh, of, of, this, of this figure um, is a map of where deformation was actually observed. So it shows the, um, the, the summit of Mount St. Helens. This is a, uh, a, a, a map that's um, dimensions are roughly four kilometers by four kilometers. So it's mostly the, the edifice. And what you can see is that the only spots that were moving were on the north flank. And these arrows, red arrows coming off of them, uh, coming away from the circles, show the average distances that were being measured. And some of them were up to two meters or six feet per day. Tremendous, tremendous rates of deformation. But only on the north flank. The rest of the volcano really didn't deform all that much. And uh, this is a graph here that shows the deformation rate uh, uh, of, of deformation measurements uh, that, were, that, were, uh, that were made uh, at uh, the summit from uh, the Coldwater uh, Observation Place uh, going from May 4th all the way out to May 18th. And uh, average was about 1.4 meters per day for that particular target. And uh, this last data point here is taken on the morning of May 18th by David Johnston, about two hours before the start of the 1980 eruption. So with all this uh, monitoring instrumentation, collected a lot of data, and overall the trend line with uh, the seismicity was that uh, after the initial intensification going up to that first explosion on May, uh, March 27th, after that time, the numbers of earthquakes per unit time fluctuated, but mostly declined a little bit. That's shown here in this graphic. This uh, black line here shows numbers of earthquakes uh, per six hours, so it goes up to 40. Um, and over time, uh, from March 27th down to May 15th, uh, the number of earthquakes per six hours uh, went from uh, averaging 20 to 30 to down to five or 10 by the time of May 18. This red line, however, shows the seismic energy, the sort of adding up all the, ma the, the magnitudes of the earthquakes. And uh, what you can see is that the seismic energy that was being released by the volcano was holding roughly steady over this time, which translated to fewer earthquakes, but they were larger. Um, from the, the bulge, that, that deformation that I met that I showed you before, um, this is a six picture sequence, a little bit grainy, my apologies for that. Uh, that shows the summit from 1964 and then 1980, uh, March 29th, 1980, April 8th, 1980, April 10th, April 26th, and May 2nd, 1980. And you can see with your eyes that the bulge uh, was growing quite steadily at, again, a rate of about five or six feet a day. So this next graphic here is a Healer Quarter plot that shows um, 24 hours leading up to May 18. Uh, actually, 12 hours, my apologies, 12 hours leading up to May 18, from the vantage point of the station that was installed one kilometer, about a half a mile away from the summit of, uh, of Mount St. Helens. And uh, what I want you to appreciate is that down here, this lower right-hand uh, arrow, red hair arrow, shows the onset of the May 18 eruption. This is you know, right when it started. And uh, what does not appear in this helicopter plot is that there is no change in the rate of seismicity or in the size of the earthquakes, either up or down, in the hours leading up to the 8.32 onset. This eruption started without any short-term warning. <clears throat> and here it is again. This is a, 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 another vantage point from that station that's 70 uh, miles away, CPW. Same thing, Webb a quarter plot, and here's this red arrow that shows, uh, shows the onset. Um, 
And so um, this was a sobering thing for scientists. Um, the, one of the 57 people died. One of the colleagues, David Johnston, died. And there had been optimism that there would be warning that would allow people to, to you know, evacuate fairly safely. And really, there was no warning. There was no way that anybody could have forecast the exact moment in time when that eruption was going to happen. So this uh, next slide here shows the graphic of how the, the of the of the start of the May 18 eruption. This is a fairly famous uh, photographic sequence taken by Gary Rosenquist. Uh, from it's four photographs in this case. The first one taken 10 seconds uh, after the start, and then 42 seconds, 52 seconds, and then 60 seconds. And so very rapidly, this event transformed into a, a just a, a, a cataclysmic event. And in the space of 10 minutes, the landscape was changed fundamentally around Mount St. Helens. Um, this occurred in a series of landslides. This graphic here shows a cartoon of a series of uh, slices. There were three main blocks that were involved, landslide blocks that were involved in the eruption. And this had the effect, this landslide had the effect of instantly removing the pressure from the magma that had been intruding into the volcano since March 20th. And that had the effect of taking the lid off of the shaken up soda bottle and instantly uh, created a very explosive situation. So, and that's, and this picture uh, shows the ash column that uh, was, was ongoing for a number of hours uh, on May 18th. So now I want to walk you through some of the effects of the 1980 eruption, starting with the blast. This is a picture showing a landscape that used to have a lot of tall trees. Now all the trees are, are blown down in different kinds of, of eerily uh, um, geometric patterns. And uh, the blast uh, really transformed the landscape very, very, very fast. Again, it was produced because the landslide took the pressure instantaneously off of the volcano, off of the magma that intruded. Um, the landslide itself uh, came down the volcano and interacted uh, with uh, different bodies of water. Uh, this is a picture looking into uh, towards Spirit Lake, and you can see a lot of, uh, of, of hummocks. Uh, actually, this is not Spirit Lake, this is Coldwater Lake, and you can see uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of chunks of the landslide uh, having uh, wound up um, there. Um, this is a before and after vantage point taken from the north looking towards the south, towards Mount St. Helens, and uh, on the left-hand side is what it used to look like, and on the right-hand side is how much, gives you a really good, strong sense of how much uh, mass was lost in the 1980 eruption. Another component of the eruption were the lahars, and uh, the lahars uh, were really incredibly large. This, uh, there's three photographs here. The first one shows uh, mud going up a tree, maybe 30, 40 feet. There's a geologist down here for scale, so that's six feet. Um, then there's another photo here in the up, upper uh, right-hand side that shows a bridge that is being destroyed by a whole bunch of logs that are being transported by the lahar downstream. And then lastly, in the lower right-hand side is a picture of a house that um, <clears throat> was inundated by the lahar, and you can see a high water mark that goes about halfway up the front door. Um, the lahars, this is a map that shows the extent of the lahars that came off of 1980. Uh, the largest ones came down the North Fork of the Tootle River, and went down into the uh, Cowlitz River and then up into the Columbia. The net total damage from the Lahars was uh, 27 bridges destroyed, 200 homes damaged, and also it obstructed the, uh, the passageway along the Columbia for the ports of Vancouver and Portland. And 31 ships were kept from leaving the ports of Vancouver and Portland, as well as a number of ships were not able to come uh, up the channel to, uh, to um, do their business. And also, um, since then, this has produced a long-term flooding issue with all this sediment that is still up in the Tool River Valley. Um, then also there's the ash, and this is a video that I'm going to show you that uh, shows the ash clouds, a satellite vantage point, and here goes the ash cloud going uh, across Mount uh, Washington and then out into Idaho and then down into Montana and you can see it spreading and reaching all the way now out to Colorado and uh, and outwards. Um, it was a very broad ash cloud and ultimately went around the globe. Um, measurable de deposits uh, extended out uh, out to Colorado um, among other states. 
<clears throat> and here's a map that shows the measurable deposits, uh, pl places where measurable deposits were, were found. Um, the easternmost spot was, in fact, uh, Oklahoma. And then here's a picture that shows uh, what that cloud looked like as it was approaching communities in eastern Washington with lots of pillows, pillow-like structures in the cloud, very eerie, very silent, uh, and, and uh, yeah. Um, this is a, this next slide here shows a, a headline from the Oregon Journal that is related to a June 12, 1980 eruption. So the May 18 eruption, the winds were blowing from the west to the east, so the ash went to the east, but on June 12th, Ash and the winds were blowing more to the south and to the um, to the west, and so a lot of the ash came down towards Portland and Vancouver, and uh, this this is a, you know front page of the Oregon Journal with the story about that eruption. And it also has a map that shows where deposits where ash was reported, and you know, this hatchard area extends from Tacoma down through Olympia to Woodland, Vancouver, Portland, and even as far south as Salem, as far east as Hood River, and all the way out to the coast to Tillamook and Newport. So a lot of areas got ash. It wasn't a lot of ash, um, and uh, but it was enough to be a nuisance. This picture shows that ash from the 405 highway in Portland, and uh, it looks like a foggy day, but it's ash. It's not moisture, and ash has got a different uh, sensibility about it and, and it can be bad for for uh, for windshields and things like that to, to have them um, so uh, and then this also shows uh, this next picture here shows how you get rid of ash by putting water on it okay so that's the 1980s story and now uh, in the next five minutes or so I'm gonna do a very quick uh, run through of what has happened at Mount St. Helens since then using this graphic which uh, shows all the earthquakes that have been located by the University of Washington from 1980 through to the present. Um, this graphic shows uh, depth from the surface, and then there's zero kilometers depth, which is sea level, and then it goes down all the way to 20 kilometers depth, and then uh, it goes left to right from 1980 to 2020. And I've indicated in here uh, uh, by color periods of time when Mount St. Helens was erupting from 1980 to 86 and 2004 to 2008, those are in red, and then in green are the time periods between when it was not erupting. And I'm going to focus first on 1980 to 86. Uh, there were a series of 20 lava dome building eruptions uh, in the crater that progressively built up a lava dome that in the end wound up being about 90 million cubic meters. Um, monitoring of the eruptions there was a remarkable success story. Um, scientists used tricks like measuring with tape measures uh, the crater floor, this graphic over here, this photo here, shows a thrust fault that's going across the crater flow and scientists floor, and scientists are measuring the progression of that uh, uh, over time. Uh, this next picture here shows a ground crack with steam coming out of it, and scientists are again with a tape measure measuring the width of that ground crack. And um, those were the, the rates of progression of those ground cracks were things that people could track. Also, on the seismology side of things, uh, this is a graphic that shows representative signals of different types of uh, earthquakes that were recorded by the network. And uh, one of the things that seismologists observed in the buildup to eruptions is that there was a transition in earthquake type from type H to type M to type L. This, these H, H means high frequency, which basically means the number of wiggles per unit time. And uh, type M means medium frequency, fewer wiggles per unit time. L means low frequency, a lot fewer wiggles per unit time. And then finally, things progressed to uh, type S, which were surface events. And so this pro progression from H to M to L proved to be diagnostic and allowed people to come up with fairly accurate forecasts for when a volcano was going to erupt. And this next, next graphic here shows time histories of seismic energy release, of dome expansion as measured by things like that crater, uh, the, the measuring of the crack widths, um, also inflation from tilt meters, and lastly, sulfur dioxide. And uh, this, these graphs run in time from, in this case, uh, January of 1982 through to the onset of the eruption on March, of, uh, March 19th of 1982. And these um, black bars up here on the top correspond to successively uh, increasingly precise forecast windows of, of um, time shortening. And this last bar here is about 12 hours in width. And that's how precise uh, scientists were able to get the forecasts. So um, that was the time period of 1980-86. 
Uh, then we went into an almost 18-year period where nothing was happening at the surface from 1987 to 2004. What you can see in this graphic, again, that shows time versus depth with earthquakes, is that um, in contrast to 1980 through 1986, when most of the earthquakes were shallow around sea level and above, uh, starting in 1987, we started to get earthquakes that were deeper, going down as far as 10 kilometers, and relatively fewer earthquakes at shallow depths. Um, scientists believe that these deeper earthquakes were occurring in response to some repressurization happening inside the magmatic system uh, that feeds the surface of Mount St. Helens, and uh, that the volcano in this case was building to the next eruption. Now that next eruption happened in 2004. And uh, that started on September 23rd, 2004. This is a multi-day Web a quarter plot. Again, you read these left to right, top to bottom. Um, this shows uh, earthquakes from a station in the crater uh, on September 23rd, 24th, 25th. The storm started at about 2 o'clock in the morning on the 23rd. And then you can see with your eyes that numbers of earthquakes increased per unit time through the 24th. And then by the end of the 24th into the 25th, they started decreasing. At this point, we thought this was, you know, obviously very notable, but did not uh, have us thinking it was going to erupt, partly because we'd seen a similar kind of swarm back in 2001. These two plots here show uh, day-long web quarter plots for November 3rd and November 4th. And again, you can see numbers of earthquakes were kind of increasing per unit time, and then uh, into the November 4th, they started decreasing per unit time. So that's what we thought was going on here at first, but then... The next day, earthquakes got bigger again. This is, this is I, I continue this plot down to September 26th. And then also we started seeing this change in event type from high frequency, or in this case, we call them volcano tectonic earthquakes because we've gotten fancier with labels in the last 40 years. And then uh, we went to low frequency events um, on, on the 25th. And so it was those two things, these increase in earthquakes and also this change in event types that had us thinking we were dealing with potentially another uh, eruption at Mount St. Helens. Uh, meanwhile, on the deformation front, the first continuous GPS station was installed at the Johnston Ridge Observatory in 1998. Uh, that this is a picture of that GPS instrument uh, with a hemispheric dome on top of the roof of Johnston Ridge Observatory. And uh, over here on the right-hand side, I'm showing the trend lines, the data lines, for um, the northeast and vertical channels. And, um, the most important thing to note here is that from 1998 to 2004, there's no change in deformation. So from a deformation perspective, this eruption was a surprise. And yes. So then on September 23rd, this is a fairly complicated plot that, that also shows, uh, um, shows this uh, north in blue, east-west in, in dark blue, and then vertical in orange trends in this one station. And uh, right on the September 23rd, this station moved about a centimeter towards the volcano, which was interpreted to correspond to a uh, withdrawal of magma from the surface. Um, we did have one deep GPS instrument that was in the crater. It was not functioning at the time of the eruption. And uh, this graphic here shows the trend lines from that station from 2002 to 2004. The only thing that was happening there, these green dots correspond to the vertical deformation, the reds and the orange are horizontal. There was uh, actual sagging of the 1980-86 lava dome during this time frame in response to cooling. But when we did get a scientist out there on September 28th, we found lots of vertical motion going upwards as well as motion to the north corresponding with the, the lava dome moving away from the center of the crater. Um, so after all the earthquakes, the first explosion happened on October 1st eight days from the start of unrest. So 1980, we had seven days. 2004, we had eight days. Um, at that point in time, the media showed up like crazy. Um, this is a picture that shows the Cascades Volcano Observatory and a number of TV satellite trucks stationed outside of the observatory. Uh, this is a picture. Next picture shows a press conference that's being held inside our conference room um, with a scientist addressing the press. And uh, we also had uh, the, the media outside, out at Mount St. Helens. This graphic shows a number of satellite trucks uh, just parked just a little ways uh, north of Mount St. Helens. Um, they were there to beam the eruption to uh, anybody who wanted to see it. 
Uh, when we were working at the volcano, this picture shows what the traffic was like on either side of the road going up to the Johnson Ridge Observatory. There are people that were parked out there uh, for days. And uh, so this just illustrates that even though these you know, the, the eruptions can be small, they can still be very high consequence, at least for, um, uh, uh, for emergency managers who have to deal with all the people that are there. Um, so this last graphic here shows the record of earthquakes from September 23rd down to September 30th. You can see that earthquakes increased uh, 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 over time, building up to the very first explosion that happened on October 1st. Um, and that was uh, really you know, the, the marker for when, when things got going. So what I'm going to show you next is a sequence of... Um, uh, of graphics. These, are, these look like photos. They're taken from air photos, but they're digital elevation models of the surface of Mount St. Helens. And uh, this first graphic shows uh, 19, uh, what it looked like in 1986. There's the 1980-86 Lava Dome here. Um, here's 2004. The Lava Dome has um, been uh, surrounded by a glacier, the Crater Glacier. And then on October 4th, uh, here is you can see deformation corresponding to intrusion of magma uh, coming up at the surface and pushing the glacier aside. Here's October 11th when we finally had magmatic temperatures at the surface. And then October 13th, the intrusion is moving towards the south. Uh, and November 4th, here's, a, as you can see, very obviously a lava spine uh, that's been erupted at the surface. And then I'm just going to page through these. November 29th, um, we continue to move um, magma out of the ground. The, great, the crater glacier continues to deform off to the side. You can see crevasses building up on these lobes. And then uh, the activity continues through 2005. There's another spine, July 14th, that comes out. And then activity shifts over to the southwestern side of the crater um, as we get another spine building. And out it goes to 2006. And this is the last graphic. And you can see here these lobes of the crater uh, glacier that had flown all the way out to the crater floor well north of the 1980-86 lava dome. Um, this was all accompanied by a lot of earthquakes, including things that were very regularly spaced that we call drum beats. And that's what this graphic here shows, is regularly spaced earthquakes in a Weber quarter plot. Um, so um, that all produced what we see today as the, la the, 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 the Mount St. Helens uh, landscape. Um, here's a graphic that shows the 1980-86 lava dome. The 2004-2008 lava dome was erupted behind it. And then in the foreground, looking out to the north, uh, there's the pyroclastic flow deposits from 1980, as well as the landslide deposits in red uh, off to the side. And that's, if you go out to Mount, Mount St. Helens today, this is, what you look, this is what you see, and this is how it was produced. So as far as the last thing I want to leave you with is what's going on today. Um, the uh, current monitoring network is quite good. This map here shows all of the seismic stations, uh, which are re uh, in red, and the GPS stations, which are in blue. Uh, we also have one gas monitoring station out there. Um, the GPS stations from 2008, the end of the 2004 uh, uh, eruption, 2008 to the present, uh, showed um, net motion away from the volcano uh, up to two centimeters between 2008 and 2014. Uh, that was interpreted to be a result of magma coming into the volcano. And also we saw evidence for that again in the deeper earthquakes. And uh, this is a schematic model that shows the location of the inflation source in this orange um, box, which is at a depth of about 7.5 kilometers. And then the 2008-2014 earthquakes, which again were deeper than what was happening during the eruption itself, uh, those extended from a zero to about 2.5 kilometers. And uh, all told, we uh, um, felt this was evidence that the volcano was again recharging. And so on April 30th, 2014, we issued an information statement jointly with the University of Washington stating that uh, the two lines of evidence from the GPS network and the seismic network gave us confidence to say that magma reservoir has been slowly repressurizing since 2008 and that the volcano is slowly building towards its next eruption, which would be could be years to decades down the road. And, uh, and that's where we are today. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead to the end. And thank you for your attention. And um, just uh, as a, a sort of a concluding thought that we all live in the Pacific Northwest, uh, which is a spectacular place. It features volcanoes. Uh, which are evidence of a dynamic landscape, and it behooves all of us to understand 
the kinds of things that can happen uh, in our areas. And uh, if we understand the hazards and understand how to work with them, how to live with them, then we can uh, live harmoniously with the volcanoes in our midst. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and have a good evening.